Hello Retro Gamers and welcome back to Sunday Quickie. Yes, that's right, Sunday Quickie, where we have low production values, no script. I just sit here and talk and we all have, hopefully, a good time. Today's subject is the closure of the PlayStation Network on the PSP, the PS Vita, and the PS3. So as you can imagine, this is pretty big news in the gaming space, although I think we're, we're, we're all a little bit surprised about the PSP's online store still being open, but I will get into that in a second. But the PSP and PS3 stores are set to close in July, while the PS Vita store will also close a little bit later in August. As with storefronts that are this big, there are a lot of games on there that are digital only. So once the store closes, really, they're going to be gone forever. Unless, of course, you pirate them. So, with us having, you know, a little bit of notice that these stores are closing, I started trawling the web looking for lists of games that are only available on the three respective stores. And I downloaded what seemed good to me. So, this is not a comprehensive list of what's available digital only on these stores. There are resources online if that's what you're after, but these are games that are interesting to me. So please keep that in mind. If something obvious is missing, I've probably read about it and I do encourage you to comment below what you would like to play before it's gone forever. But these are games that I want to play. So let's start with the PSP. Now saying that the PSP's online store is closing down, it's it's a bit of a lie. No, I'm not going to lie. I was shocked to hear that it was still open. I've only owned the PSP for a couple of years. I never had it as a kid. I had a DS like everyone else. And I was shocked to learn that it was still online. I thought it would have closed years ago. And it kind of seems that that is indeed the case. So first, getting the PSP online, like physically online, is a bit of a mission in itself. Obviously, being such aged hardware, the Wi-Fi protocols it relies on are well out of date. So you've basically got to turn the security off on your router for it just to connect in the first place. What I ended up doing was hotspotting off my phone, which was connected to the Wi-Fi network anyway, and it only offered WAP2, or WEP2, whatever it is, as well as none. The, the WAP2 or WAP2, whatever it is, that didn't work, it didn't see it, so I just turned it off completely. I was When I was downloading stuff on this, I had completely unrestricted Wi-Fi. Anyone could have just jumped in and used it, so if you did, good for you, but anyway, that's how I did it. However, once you're online and you go into the shop front, you're faced with another issue. It's completely blank. <laughs> There's nothing there. All that's there is a message saying that for all future purchases, you have to go to this specific URL. And you can't even click it there. You have to manually go into the web browser and access it. However, that redirects to a different URL where there's no PSP games to be found at all. <laughs> so at that point in time, I was like, wait, is the PSP store even active? And in many cases, it's not. But there is a bit of a workaround and it involves the PS Vita, this thing. So I'll get into the PS Vita, the games I want to play later on in the video. But to actually download a PSP game, I had to log into my into the store on this. And luckily, this is completely backwards compatible with the PSP. At least I think it's completely backwards compatible. Regardless, you can download all the games for the PSP on the PS Vita. And that's essentially how you do it. So you download it on this. So you need a PS Vita. And then luckily on the PSP store itself, while there's nothing on there, you can access your downloads list which, because you know, you have to sign in with your account and everything. So from there, I can scroll through the downloads lists, find the PSP game I've downloaded, and bam, we've downloaded something off the online store for the PSP. Although having said that, I did find two random PS1 games. I think it was Tomb Raider 2 and like a Hercules game. I found those while searching for Ape Quest, which is the game I ultimately ended up downloading. Not sure why those are there, I didn't find anything else whatsoever. I searched many different things and well, just many different words and nothing came up. So for some reason, those are still there. So yeah, anyway. So into what I downloaded. Uh, there were two things I was going to download. Well, one of those things I actually did download. What I did download was ApeQuest and I'll get more into depth in that in a moment. But I also wanted to download a Loco Roco game. So if you go back through my videos, quite recently I reviewed Loco Roco on the PSP, which I've got the physical disc for, and I absolutely loved it. 
There is a spin-off for Loco Roco 2 called Loco Roco Midnight Carnival. And this was download only. I think it's um, Halloween themed. I didn't end up buying it though because it was over $20. And honestly, I just wasn't really willing to spend that much. Everything else I bought in here, I'm pretty sure all of it was all under 10 bucks. And, you know, I have a limited amount of free money to spend. So ultimately I passed on it. But that was in the running, that's something I could have downloaded. And that is something that is digital only. So as per the theme of this video, if you don't download it now, you'll have to get it by other means. You know, pirating other I just, you have to download it illegally. That's <laughs> the point I'm trying to make. So anyway, what I did end up getting was Ape Quest. Now I'm a big fan of the Ape Escape series. The original Ape Escape is one of my all time favorite games on the PlayStation 1. And I don't think I've ever actually covered it here before. So I probably should get around to that sooner or later. Regardless, Ape Quest is a spin-off. And let me just be really unprofessional here and refer to my notes. It was digital only in Western regions. So Europe, America, and down here in Australia. But in, Amer in, sorry, in Japan, it was actually released as a, you know, in the physical release in the UMD. So I'm, a I'm cheating here a little bit, but from what I can tell, the Japanese release is completely in Japanese. And just because of the way the game plays, you want to be able to read what's happening on screen. So it differs from the usual Ape Escape gameplay quite a bit. Instead, it's an RPG sort of set on rails, if you will. Think about a board game, how you, you move from, you know, area to area to area. So when I run from one point to another, the game completely takes over. I don't, I, you can't really run around, around freely. You basically get to a crossroads and you decide which direction you want to go in. And as you're moving around, random encounters will happen. So the ones that I'm most fond of are all the mini games, because there's, and there's quite a few of them. For example, here's one where you have to run away from a boulder, and as the boulder comes, it's bouncing down the hill as you're running for your life, and you basically have to jump as just before the boulder impacts of the ground, otherwise, you know, you'll get shook and slowed down. Just stuff like that. There's another one where you're like type type rope type rope walking across a chasm. Just stuff like that. Otherwise, there's uh, you know, just sort of Final Fantasy style fights. And I say Final Fantasy style fights because this is far from the genre of gameplay I'm into. I'm, I really don't have much experience with it whatsoever, but essentially turn-based combat. These encounters will happen quite randomly and yeah, basically you just take turns hitting each other over the head with blunt instruments. Or using, you know, magic and powers and all that sort of stuff. So generally, as you can tell by the way I'm explaining it, Definitely far from my type of game. I'm just not really into turn-based combat, and I'm, I know people get very defensive of it, so I am sorry, but I've tried many times over the years and just can't get into it. However, I am willing to make an exception for Ape Escape because I just love the living heck out of that series. So, since the PSP is pretty old, out of all the games I show in this video, this one's probably the most likely to actually get a review at some point. And bam, I've turned on the overhead light. I thought the footage was looking a little bit grainy and, you know, probably no one cares, but comment below if you do. I guess people will comment over anything, so I guess it's not too far-fetched. Anyway, on to the PlayStation 3. So the PlayStation 3 has a very special place in my heart because, you know, I was like 15, 16 when it came out and it was the very first console I ever bought with my own money, having worked a crappy part-time job at a grocery store. And that grocery store actually ended up burning down and I lost my job. So there's a fun fact from my childhood for you. Probably an insurance scam. Anyway, that's completely unrelated to PlayStation games that you won't be able to download in a couple of months. Um, the first, and this is, I'm just going to jump straight into the favorite thing that I found because this game is absolutely nuts, but it's so fun. It's called Trash Panic and it's kind of like a Tetris-like game, but... It was released on something like World Earth Day or something, and it's, which doesn't really make much sense, really. But it's you know talking about reusing stuff and not wasting stuff, even though that's that's exactly what you do in this game. <laughs> so basically, you're in control of a conveyor belt of just random junk, and you basically, well, I wouldn't say control because it's all coming in pretty fast and friendly. What you do have control over is rotating the items 
and then from how far up they drop into this trash area or garbage area if we're being linguistic, linguistically friendly. I don't think even saying that is linguistically friendly to other Australians. Basically, you want to smash this stuff and compact it in as best you can. So say for a light bulb, for example, you don't want to drop that with the connection first because it's going to hit the metal. You want to rotate it so it hits glass first and smashes everywhere so there's more room for other stuff. And basically you just make your way through these levels and you just you just want to fill up the, the trash container as efficiently as possible. And there are a few things to aid you in doing this. For example, sometimes you'll get these random rolls of toilet paper which you know, which we shouldn't be wasting at the moment, especially when a lockdown happens and everyone scrambles to buy 20 packets of it. But basically, you can throw in the rolls of bog and then they give you a lit match to light it on fire. So then everything wooden or, you know, fabric that goes in after it will also catch on fire and it will get incinerated, meaning that you'll have more space in the trash area for more trash, if that makes sense. So you, you, you probably understand now why well, I don't really see why they're trying to tack on the environmentally friendly message, <laughs> but it's, it's very Japanese. And basically you have three chances of stuff falling out. And once that happens, it's game over and you have to restart the level. And they'll throw things in there to make this difficult, like bouncy balls. Because if you throw in a bouncy ball too hard, that thing is going to bounce out of there and that's it. You've lost a life, as it were. So it is mega fun. It's very full on. It gets really just like Tetris. As soon as you start to get to the top of that, you know, the, the containment area, it gets pretty, you know, the frenziness kind of steps in because you can't really slam shit in anymore. Sorry, I didn't mean to swear. Because, you know, it's too close away. So, yeah, that's when you really start praying for the lit match so you can start burning stuff. And, yeah, out of all the things that you can't download anywhere else, this is really the most tragic. It's pretty much built for handhelds. It's a shame that it's only on PS3. Even if it was on the Vita, I'd be happy, but it never got a mobile release, let alone the Switch, since it's nearly 10 years old. But... Yeah, if there's anything out of this list that I want to be re-released, it's definitely Trash Panic. I had loads of fun playing this. Okay, next up we're going into what is probably the most comprehensive game on this list. And when I mean comprehensive, I mean it's pretty involved. And I feel like in the couple of playthroughs I had for this video, I was barely scratching the surface. So if it feels like if you've played this before and it looks like I'm missing out on very obvious features, that is why, but I'm definitely keen to give this much more of a play. Tokyo Jungle is what it's called, and I am kind of cheating here a little bit because it actually did feature on a physical disc. And that was called the Best of PlayStation Network Volume 1, which was a compilation disc full of uh, just games that had been hits on the PlayStation Network. I'm still including it here though because that disc is not very easy to come by. I don't know if it's rare, probably just uncommon is a better descriptor for it. But I looked on eBay make, you know, for making this video and it goes for a couple of hundred bucks. So I can't remember how much I paid on the PSN, but it was a lot less than that, even when you include the other games. So basically it's set in a post-apocalyptic Tokyo, about 10 years in the future, I believe, which would have been about 20 years in the future when it was made. And all humans have disappeared. So there is a bit of, you know, there's an air of mystery going on, but all the pets are still there and they've basically, they've taken over the city. They've gone wild. I wouldn't say feral because it looks like they've got somewhat of a society going, but not really. So anyway, you start off on the very low ends of the food chain. Basically, you start off as a, either a Pomeranian dog or a deer. And basically, you just have to survive. That is really the, the gist of the game, where you survive and you breathe. Which is, you know, I guess that's life. So basically, it's sort of like an isometric perspective. Uh, so the graphics are pretty good. Because, you know, really everything's just shown from one angle. And you run around and you kill things smaller than you. So if you're a Pomeranian, that just, that's basically rabbits and other smaller animals. And you have to keep eating because obviously if you starve, you die. And basically you just want to take over territory. So you go to new areas and it doesn't actually show up, but I assume you probably, you know, do a bit of, a, bit of this and you mark your territory. And then you basically, you kill enough things and you eat them and you become an alpha and... Then other little lady dogs want to make little babies with you and basically you continue on continue on your genes and your legacy and it just goes through the generations. 
from what I've gathered reading into it, and I did accidentally spoil the plot for myself doing this, so just be cautious, there is quite an involved story here figuring out why the world is this way. Like, where are all the humans? Why did they disappear? And yeah, it looks like there's lots of different missions, lots of different characters, boss fights. I, yeah, I just, I can't say enough how much I feel like I've scratched the surface of this, of this game. It seems quite large. And because it's Japanese, there's lots of fun stuff going on. You know, lots of, uh, a lot of little hidden features. You can find little archival tapes from the humans. And I think that's more or less supposed to progress the story. So if, yeah, if you want something pretty, pretty involved, Tokyo Jungle, look it up. All right, next up we have a MotorStorm game. And obviously MotorStorm is quite a prominent series, especially on the PS3, but there was an online only release called MotorStorm RC. And if you've ever played Micro Machines, which I love, you'll definitely enjoy this. RC obviously stands for Remote Control. See how easy it is to review things without a script? <laughs> I'm just explaining it how it is. But it's, 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 I mean, it's a pretty much a ripoff of Micro Machines. There isn't really any way around it. It just has the MotorStorm label slapped on it. But of course it has the level of polish that we've come to expect from the MotorStorm series. So obviously it's set from above and the controls are a little bit weird because you're not behind turning left or right, you're on top. And you know, it just affects things and it makes things just a little bit different, a little bit more exciting. And there is loads of content for this game. So. There's just like a complete pack you can download that gives you everything, but it completely wrecks your download lists. So I don't know who approved this, I don't know who's responsible, but I just want to say that I hate you. I don't need every single little car in my download list. It should have just been one download. My download list is wrecked forever, so thank you. But besides from that, it is a very fun game. There's lots of different modes, there's millions of different tracks, especially if you download all the extra content. And yeah, there isn't really much to say. It's a racing game. It's just, it wins on the fact that the handling is really good. Like the MotorStorm series has always been known for its polish. And the fact that there is just so much content, just be aware of, of your poor little downloads list. And another cool aspect of it is that it, that it supports crossplay. So if you buy it on the PS Vita or the PS3, you can then play it on either or. You've only, you only have to buy it once. And also your save game transfers between the two. It, obviously it saves in the cloud or something. So hopefully that's a feature that will still stay once they remove it from the store forever. There's just, you know, there's a lot of what ifs with this. You know, Sony have been actually a little bit, um, no, they just haven't been very descriptive of the whole thing. But anyway, that's not really what this video was about. So, you know, you can play it on your Vita as well. And I guess that is probably a good transition into the Vita itself. So unlike the PSP, it is still very easy to log onto the store and download everything. The store is still fully featured and will be until August, as of making this video anyway. Now, especially with the Vita, there are some very obvious online downloads here that I won't be mentioning because basically all of them are RPGs. And the Vita is known for being a very RPG heavy system, which is, you know, kind of sucks for me because I don't really play those games. But I did find some really cool online only games that have nothing to do with that sort of gameplay. First up, we have a game called Frobisher Says, <laughs> which is, you know, the name itself is pretty intriguing, but if you've ever played WarioWare, it's very akin to that. Just lots of little mini games. And it's also good for multiplayer as well. This is before the Switch, so this, oh, what's it called? There's a game I've played on the Switch. I've played it at lots of different parties, which is basically just a bunch of mini games and stuff. And the cool thing about that particular game is other people can jump in and play on their smartphones. So, but this is kind of before all of that, at least by a couple of years, as far as I can tell. And the mini games, obviously you can't do things like incorporate your smartphone, but the mini games should be commended because they do take advantage of all the cool features that the PS Vita has, which a lot of the games really don't. Some may see them as gimmicky, but I'm talking about the touchpad on the back. Um, I'm talking about the gyro controls and also the camera built in. Basically, there's all these different little mini games. They only go for a couple of seconds each. Like you've got to stomp on villages by, you know, <laughs> pretending you're walking across the screen, stuff like that. Um, the camera stuff, it's not that great because the camera on here is, you know, 100% potato vision. And I was usually playing it in the dark of my bed. So it'd be like, film me something blue. And I'd be like, you know, 
my sheets in the better blue, but it's too dark. But luckily you can skip them. So it's a lot of fun. I did find the humour in it quite good as well. Although I, I am into that kind of annoying humour, as you can probably tell by my own humour. A lot of people probably won't like that. Otherwise, the games do get a little bit repetitive. But same thing with Motorstorm. Um, you can just download everything in one go because there was you know, some extra packs and stuff released over the lifespan of its release. <laughs> Sentences are really coming together right now. So there is lots of content there for very little money. I think I paid like $3 all in all for everything. So you definitely don't feel ripped off. Okay, next up, we're going to finish with my other favorite game out of all the things I've downloaded for this video and explored over the week. And that is TXK, made by another, made by none other than Jeff Minter, who, of course, is famous for Tempest and his development studio, Llamasoft. So TXK has a bit of a storied history. Basically, it came out on the Vita and it was planned for the PSP, the PS4, and also Android devices. But since it is a Jeff Minter game, it is pretty similar to Tempest, and apparently Atari did not like this at all, and or what Atari was at that point in time, and basically started threatening with their lawyers. So shame on you, Atari. That is, you know, it's Jeff Minter's game. You probably just have the rights to a game that is very similar to it. But yeah, shame on you. Shame. So if you've played any Tempest game at all, you know the drill. But this game is so well made. It is so fun. The controls are great. It just sucks you in. The shooting stuff, the, the music, the visuals, everything about it, it just has that Llama Soft flair to it and Jeff Minter flair that you've come to expect. So it is a shame that this can't be found anywhere else because that certainly wasn't supposed to be its destiny. But luckily there is Tempest 4000, which is a very similar game. And I think a lot of, from what I've read, I haven't played it myself, but a lot of, a lot of stuff from TXK was integrated directly into it. And for some reason that has Atari's blessing while well, this doesn't. So if you don't have a PS Vita or no way to play that otherwise, yeah, play Tempest 4000, I guess. <laughs> Although this is far from a review. So anyway, I'm going to leave the video there. Hopefully you've, you know, enjoyed my recommendations and maybe you'll download some of these yourself. As I just said, the, these, this is what I'm saying, trying to say, the words coming out of my mouth. Um, Far from a review, <laughs> and I've far from fully played these games either. I've really just been playing them in my spare time over the week. Download them before they're gone. I think it will also be good to support the developers as well. I mean, the bigger ones, we don't, you know, I guess it doesn't really matter. But, you know, when it comes to something like Llamasoft and TXK, as far as I can probably tell, if, if you buy it on the PS Vita now, that money is still going to Llamasoft, or at least I bloody hope it is. So, yep, tell me below what you'll be downloading or what you enjoyed on the PS Vita. Physical, digital, doesn't matter. I don't care. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch you in the next video.